these two lectures in a row, um, we'll deal with uh, two different spaces that we talked about of great, of equal, you know, each of great importance within modeling, but used in, in different ways. And it's important to put in perspective. So one of them is uh, state space, um, where points within the space indicate uh, a, are associated with a particular state of the system, right? Um, so uh, perhaps a certain value for S, for the state S, the state I, uh, and uh, indeed uh, the state R. So if we have a certain point here, sort of in, in state space, um, not illustrating this very well, but it has a certain state vector associated with it, saying a value for I, or for R, and for S, right? Um, so this is state space. And particle filtering reasons about uh, about the distribution of the states of the system in light of uh, the model and uh, observed data. Um, so here, uh, when we get a new datum, um, whether it's a, a vector of, of observations, um, this might be an observation vector or a single observation, it, it um, allows us to estimate the state um, within the space, a distribution over the state. And as we'll see today, the fundamental way it does this is through drawing on the technique of important sampling. Okay? So uh, it doesn't analytically drive a form for this distribution, like it doesn't assume it's a normal, you know, multidimensional normal distribution. Rather, it, it samples from it. It is samples scattered throughout, and the samples are differentially weighted. Um, so those with higher weights are considered to, to have a, uh, you know, a, a greater essentially number of effective samples associated with them. And we're going to see the basis of it in, in sampling today. Um, but we approximate the distribution as the sum of a bunch of points distributed throughout the state space. Okay? Um, where those are points are weighted according to a point sampling. The other type of space we talked about last time was what? It begins with a P, ends with an R. It has a T in the middle. Yeah. So parameter. Param meter. I need a big E. Um, so parameter space, right? Um, and this is a space uh, familiar in many of our techniques, which you folks use. Uh, uh, so uh, calibration uses this. We're trying to find the most favorable point in parameter space from the point of view of having the model's emergent behavior best match empirical data. Um, naturally, parameterization of a model leads to a certain point in the space um, for, that specifies the values of the model's parameters. Maybe those parameters are, you know, beta, c, and uh, tau and omega, or something like that. Um, here, the points in the space do not indicate states. They indicate particular um, particular parameter vectors. So um, we assign, for a particular point in the space, we have a very particular value for each of the parameters, beta, c, tau, and omega, right? And with calibration, we're trying to find kind of the most favorable point from the standpoint of minimizing discrepancy from empirical data. But this is also of key importance in sensitivity analysis. In sensitivity analysis, um, we are we are examining the effects of changing our assumptions about the parameters. So we're kind of undergoing small perturbations within this uh, parameter space of how many, however many dimensions it is, um, and examining how does model behavior change as we change the parameters in that way. Okay. Um, now. One of the techniques we'll be talking about today in the second lecture, very likely, um, deals fundamentally with, with parameter space, and that is MCMC. Okay? Remember 
leading up, of course, to PMCMC, which will be a combination of particle physics and MCMC, but we're going to be dealing with MCMC. And MCMC involves, instead of finding the single most favorable point in the space, given the empirical data, what MCMC tries to do is to understand, okay, given the model and given the empirical data, um, how might we estimate the parameter values, take into account that we're not we're not sure of any one value. Maybe there's, you know, V can be high and C can be low, or, uh, you know, so beta can be high, excuse me, and C can be low, um, or beta can be low and C can be high as long as the product is maintained or something like that. Um, that might lead to not just one most favorable point, but a whole set of these points that are kind of equally favorable in terms of matching the data. This is not an unusual situation. And it's associated with the issue of, of identifiability. Is there enough data for the model that you can identify clearly the parameters that gave rise to this? And often the answer is no. But you might be able to say there's broad ranges of data that are plausible. And, and say there's areas of, of parameter space that are far less likely. So with MCMC, we're going to be sampling from distributions over this. So there might be some regions of the parameter space that are, are much more likely, some that are less likely, some that are less likely yet. And there may be, this may be multimodal. There might be several areas parameter space that are quite possible. It may not be a, a nice unimodal distribution where, you know, going out from some central area or less and less likely. And so MCMC, we're going we're gonna to see um, its body distributions of parameter space. So today we're dealing with two different techniques that operate with finding distributions in a space or estimating distributions in a space. First, particle filter, particle filtering, which does so estimating the distributions in state space using the technique of importance sampling, and MCMC, which estimates distributions in parameter space using a different sampling technique, one that's uh, based on Marco Chain Monte Carlo sampling. Um, uh, both of them will involve posteriors and priors, proposal distributions, target distributions, but they'll approach sampling in a different way. Okay? Um, and they operate in different spaces. Particle filtering, we're dealing with estimating the latent state of the model. What's the state of the system right now in light of all the data? And by extension trajectories. Parameter space, we're asking what are the parameters of this system and which of them are more likely, which of them are less likely, given the empirical data in the model. Okay? So it's important to keep these differently in mind. And PMCMC is going to come on both of these. Okay? I don't think we'll get to that today, but we will within our next lecture. Very likely. Okay. Now, as I said, um, I was... Um, greatly uh, uh, delayed in some prep of materials for this by some bizarre issues with uh, with PowerPoint and um, and just that interfered a lot. So the notation is not fully as consistent as I would have liked at a few places, and I hope you'll forgive me that I was rushing to get this ready, and unfortunately the computer didn't rush along with me. Microsoft did not rush along with me, that's for sure. I guess it's better than standing in front of a supposedly nearly indestructible truck with broken windows or something like that from balls you threw at it. Um, so I'll rest, um, uh, I'll rest comforted uh, that I'm not alone. Okay, so last time we had gone through a detailed derivation and I did post the slides for this, you may have noted, to the, the uh, Moodle site, um, whereby we had um, walked through uh, particle filtering 
from the perspective of the distributions involved. I often like to go from the broad to the narrow here, so you recall that particle filtering is this technique that, at a philosophical level, moves our models out of this situation where we, you know, we build them and then we use them um, without updating them um, in any any frequent way, to a situation where we have models that are more like the you know, the weather reports we depend on, or the models behind the weather reports we depend on, on daily. Those models are updated every, possibly as often as every few minutes, certainly every few hours at the least. And they're much more reliable because the forecast for tomorrow is based not on a model that was predicting on the end, beginning of the year or last week. It's based on a model, and maybe the same model, but it's been updated with an understanding of what happened, right? Particle filtering can also be viewed as, as providing key advantages when examining the effects of interventions because instead of basing your decision making on a model as it was built many, many, many months ago or years ago um, and trying to understand what I should do now, you're, you're basing on a model that's been updated with all the new data, much as the GPS knows where you are in order to give you best advice how to get to your destination. And I talked about how particle filtering can be viewed also as this kind of tomographic, it produces a tomographic view of the underlying situation within the system, a, a sort of three-dimensional view, which is coincidentally what I've drawn here, even though it could be n-dimensional space. It sort of gives you a picture of what's going on throughout the entire system, right? S, I, R here, but in general it could be 10 dimensions or 20 dimensions or what have you. Um, and it kind of approximates um, that distribution from the day you have maybe about one piece of the system or maybe a couple pieces of the system. It gives you this view throughout the system. At a philosophical level, this is about moving models in those directions. At the level of, of uh, sort of intuition, we talked about particles as hypotheses and that each particle at a given time represents a hypothesis as to what state the system is in, and those hypotheses jockey for position. They compete with one another for explaining the data. And as new data comes in, the ones that are more consistent with it um, will tend to be rewarded, and the ones that are less consistent will tend to be downplayed. Right? And I know that we captured that through wave, well, kind of waving my hands about it. Um, but these various hypotheses stand in place of a situation where we run the model in a way that puts all of our eggs in one basket and puts it lends complete faith to a particular situation as depicted in the model. I'm exaggerating, but the point is, on a normal, normal model, be it a stochastic one or a deterministic one, when we run it, we, we arc out one trajectory for system state over time. There's a single trajectory that's arced out when we run when we run a model, be it stochastic or deterministic. Here, we are actually having many jockeying hypotheses, and they're all running forward and all encountering the data, and all being um, uh, all being uh, upweighted or downweighted by that. Okay. Um, importantly, particles are not being created de novo, you know, in arbitrary positions in the space. Rather, particles, um, uh, particles uh, are fruitful and they multiply within the space. They're, they're cloned and then they evolve independently, uh, or they die out. But we're not creating entirely new particles at arbitrary places in the state uh, at, at any point with data. Rather. Those hypotheses that are there, we vest greater confidence in some of them. We downplay others. Um, but uh, at no time are we sort of creating new hypotheses um, out of whole cloth when we make an observation. And this is important. I'll be with you in just a second, Levy. It's, it's an important thing to think about that... Um, that uh, when we have a new observation, we incorporate it not by 
spinning off a new hypothesis for what's going on, but by lending greater weight to existing hypotheses. And we do this in this very powerful way, almost transparently. Instead of changing the hypothesis, this is, this is really important. Pay attention to this. This is going to be one of my more important utterances of, of, of this, these sessions and probably of today. Okay. Um, when we have a new observation of particle filtering, we are not, I repeat, we are not altering our hypotheses by virtue of that. In other words, we're not we're not saying, oh, you know, I was nearly, I was nearly uh, right with that, but I'll just tweak my hypothesis as represented by a particle. I'll, you know, I'll move it in state space a little bit as a result of the observation. That's not what's going on. There's no fiddling with the particles, a given particle's hypothesis as a result of an observation. It's not like we say, this particle was almost, almost on base will just tweak what it thinks is going on based on the observation. That's not at all what's going on. What's going on is that particles that are more consistent with the observations are upweighted. They don't change their position in state space as a result. They're just, we lend them more confidence. We lend them like Julius Caesar, who gave the, the, the talk of, uh, we come not to uh, to praise Caesar, but to bury him. Um, who was that in, in the play? Um, oh, I can't believe I can't remember this. Um, but um, was it Marcus Aureli? No, it wasn't Marcus Aureli. What am I saying? Um, um, Mark Antony, maybe. Um, in any case, uh, he said, lend, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Um, and we lend the particles our confidence by virtue of the fact they better match the data. But we don't change those hypotheses. We just, we vest greater belief in them. And some particles might disappear because they're, they have such low levels of belief they don't survive in a process of resampling. So it's very important to understand when it comes to particle filtering as well. Okay. Um, okay. So those are some preliminary comments. The lavi had a question. Um, I think you answered Okay. Okay. Um, so, so I talked about last time. You know, there's a measurement model. Uh, maybe this was two times ago now, but but where we have some state of the system, and that state induces some expectations about what we should observe. It, those expectations may be very broad in their uncertainty, um, reflecting an observation error model, you know, with uh, observation error. But the basic idea is that, you know, if, if we have a situation going on within the world of a given sort, as depicted by the model, it lends expectations about what we should observe. So if we have tons of people infected right now in the world, we probably are going to observe um, you know, some people coming in for care, reported with the cases of the illness. Maybe we'll be more, maybe it will be less, but it lends a notion that you know we should we should see some people being reported. We should see some observations that are higher for the number of people who are reporting cases of illness by presenting for care. On the other hand, um, if there's no one effect in the model, we expect to see very few. So the state of the system, as represented by x of k, um, is multidimensional. Is n components. It's it's a vector of state. Um, it lends it lends um, expectations of some sort for what we observe. Not deterministically, but in general, uh, you know, it implies it with, within some distribution, which we'll use as the basis for our likelihood function. Okay? Um, M here is the number of elements of the observation vector. It could be one if we only, each time point here, we have a single, each observation point. We have a single observation, m is 1. In general, it could be more than 1, right? We might observe the number of deaths from 
from uh, pertussis among infants and the number of new cases in the past week. And those might be two observations, right? In which case, M would be two. Or we might, we might, you know, have the number of uh, reported cases of pertussis in adults on the one hand, and children on the other, the number of deaths uh, total, and that would be three elements for observation. Okay. Um, yeah. And always smaller, or then important No, no, no. You could. It's a good question. Typically, it is. Yeah. Typically. There's large areas of our space which we might not be able to observe easily. But remember, n is dimensions of our space. And um, it's possible m is actually larger. Like in the era of big data, one of, you know, people talk about big data in very hyped ways often. But, but you folks have heard me um, from this very floor um, hold forth that big data can be defined in a somewhat more meaningful way by talking about the four V's, right? There's the V of volume, which is the big in big data. There's the velocity, it's arriving frequently. By the way, that makes it almost ideal match for particle filtering, right? right where we have this new data arriving and we have observations of it. But beyond that, variety. So often we'll have in the big data context, many measurements for a given thing. Think um, of uh, Ethica, right? Um, think of Ethica, 23 different sensors which, um, you know, which are available. Maybe survey instruments, you can ask questions about that. We, we might have dozens and dozens of observations there. We might have a small model, right? And then there's the veracity, the final, final D. Um, uh, but the um, the point is that we could we could have many observations at a given time point of relevance for our, the state of our system. But remember, not every observation is mapped directly to a uh, to a dimension or anything. It's just these are observations at different points of the system, which somehow constrain. They imply things about the underlying state. They kind of shed light on the underlying state or or constrain our sense of what it could be more likely to be and less likely to be. But it could be that, that M is very large, in which case it will, will be clearer probably about what the underlying state is, X of K. Or it could be that Y is, you know, just as only one observation and, and you know, it has a very broad uncertainty associated with it, so it, it just helps us kind of guess what it might be, um, but by putting together many Y for successive time points, it might help a lot. So the levy. Sorry, so M is the number observation? Yes, M is the, so, so Y here, I apologize for the notation, but Y and X are vectors. Mm -hmm. And here, N is being used to indicate the number of elements of X, okay? it's. This is kind of clumsy notation I adopted from elsewhere, and probably I should deep six it, but it's prevent putting arrows above this, like like a little arrow above x. Um, um, x is a vector of n elements. Y is a vector of n elements. That's all that that means. It's not like the nth y is given by this. It's just there's a vector of m elements on the left here, and a vector of n elements on, on of, of state state vector of n elements. And in general, m could be in more traditional data, m is less than n. But in today's context, m could be could be for many concerns where you have models. In many cases, m could be as large as n. Now, there's important ups, you know even within this room, this very room there's violations of this. For example, for an agent-based model, n can be extremely large. You could have dimensions and principle for each attribute of each agent. Or th think about, uh, Lavi, you're developing a geotectonic model, right, with these tectonic elements. Each of those tectonic elements might be associated with some place and spherical coordinates, right? Um, some some uh, 
theta and some phi. Um, and, and so for each agent, there would be two dimensions. And so n here might be very, very large um, compared to, uh, to, to n to m. Um, whereas for other models, an SIR model, maybe we have a bunch of observations of different sorts and we could easily have m and z down. Okay? So, so age-based models tend to have very large n. Um, yeah. Those are just some comments, okay? Okay. Um, right, and we're seeking to estimate state at a given time here, x sub k. And um, it bears understanding that if, if the system is evolving slowly compared to the sampling, successive samples will tell you a lot about today's state. Right? Like, like that's what we're dealing with uh, disease uh, like TB. TB uh, is a disease that tends to spread slowly. People, uh, many people get infected. About a third of the world, uh, I heard the estimate recently, was, uh, you know, is infected with TB. Infected with TB, but that doesn't mean they have active TB. It means they're infected with the mycobacterium. And only about 5% of those will go on to develop active TB, where they actively get sick from it. The rest, lungs, close off the granulomas, et cetera, and kind of keep it bottled up until their immune system weakens for other causes. And, um, and sometimes for other reasons as well, the TB can reactivate, but only 5% of them. And it may reactivate years later. Uh, it can reactivate sooner, and actually about half of those who go on to develop active TB do so sooner. But about half, it might take decades. And so that's a slow-moving disease. If you have frequent samples for this, or if you have samples that are at all frequent, monthly, yearly, you're getting many samples that could shed light on the current situation. And so if the sampling rate is very high compared to the dynamics, the rate associated with the dynamics of the underlying system, you can learn a lot about today's situation by looking at many observations, because those observations are very relevant. If the system is evolving at rates much faster than the sampling, the sampling you got yesterday is not going to tell you that much about the situation now. Okay? So just be aware of this kind of this competition of the speed of sampling versus the speed of the underlying system. And, you know, it could be that, that our observations here, y, y sub k here, um, aren't, aren't very big. Maybe it's a single observation. But if things move slowly in the system, then observations over many, many observations may all shed light on the current situation. Okay? Um, this is of considerable interest in other areas where things move slowly besides TB. Perhaps the preeminent point is geological movement, which even compared with TB has a more stately pace that it undertakes. Right? Um, Okay, so uh, as a reminder of notation, we're talking about state x of k at a given time, okay? And it's a vector yeah. uh, of length n. Um, uh, and we're going to have data coming in over time, y sub k. Um, and, and this is going to form a sequence from 1 to k at a given time. We're, we've seen the data from 1, from the first observation all the way till now, k. Okay, um, and um, we're going to be going recursively considering a new observation y sub k and updating a previous estimate of the state, state distribution, x sub k minus 1, what the state was just after the last observation. We're going to be updating it for this in light of this new observation to infer what the situation is now. And that involves two processes that we talked about last time. One was the prediction, where basically we had, we had an observation last year as to what the state of the system is. 
just after the last observation, we had a theory about what the state of the system was. We had these competing hypotheses. And now it's a year later, and we have a new observation. To incorporate that understanding of what's going on in the underlying system, we have to do two things. One is we have to update the model. OK, the model, we had an idea of what it was last year, but that doesn't give us the situation now for TP. We've got to run it forward by a year as to what we think from a modeling perspective might be going on. Take into account the, the insights from that last observation, the savviness of it. So we run all these particles forward for a year. And then, but those still have to incorporate the new observation. And then we incorporate the new observation, y sub k. And, and that gives us, that's the update step. And that gives us an understanding of the current um, the current situation that took into account model understanding, uh, sort of the underlying mechanisms of the system, and this, this new observation, the understanding from that data. And we mesh them into a single kind of best estimate of, of the system. But it's, I shouldn't say a single best estimate. We have these competing estimates, right? These, these, these different particles, these different hypotheses. And we went through this last time. It was a bit heavy in terms of some of the math, even though I cut out about eight slides or something. Um, but it gave us a distributional formula for, for what our, um, um, uh, for, for how we can take into account an understanding of the state of the system at time k in light of all the data till now, including k, as a product of two things. One is the state of the, our understanding of the distribution of the system at the current time, that's the x sub k, taking account all data not including the latest observation, and then a factor that takes into account the, the likelihood of this observation, this observed data point, in light of the, 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 the current state of the system. Um, so, so, so basically, we get a distribution out of x sub k uh, given y sub 1 to k minus 1. We have a formula for this. And uh, the notable thing here is that this latter thing, so, so there's two phases. This is the result of the update step um, and the result of the prediction step is what gave us this red cross. So out of the update step, we get this star and uh, out of the prediction step, we got this red cross before. It provided the ability to, to compute this, okay? Um, and uh, that that allows these two to have a net effect of mapping p sub x sub, you know, basically mapping our understanding of the system at time k minus 1, taking into account all the data up to and including that time, map from that to the current situation, taking into account our understanding of the dynamics of the system as generated by the model and our understanding of the implications of the latest data point, y sub k. It updates from this to this. And this is our recursive update. We're kind of going from this one to this one. It's kind of from prior to posterior. We're, we're updating our understanding, take your account model dynamics, and, uh, and this observation. Okay? That's what we talked about last time. But all of this was couched in, in terms of, um, couched in terms of distributions. Okay, couched in terms of probability distributions. And I'd like now to shift to an understanding of how we sample from those distributions. It may seem a puzzling thing to talk about, 